On October 12, 1978, Margaret Frame, a young mother, was walking home from her job as a school janitor. She was taking a shortcut through Stanmer Park, a shortcut she had taken many times before. The park was part of a vast nature preserve, and though there were wild areas, the park being in the middle of a suburb gave the place a sense of security. But that night, someone was watching Margaret. When she was alone, someone stabbed her from behind, piercing her heart. Then they sexually assaulted her body. Margaret's killer made a few attempts to hide what he had done from the police. He watched the search for her and moved her body to a spot that had already been searched a few days in. He tried to cut off her head, likely in an attempt to remove evidence, but failed to do so, just mangling her neck in the process. The killer eventually buried her body in a shallow grave. But when police doubled back to the area, they found it almost immediately. Her killer was never found, and the woods where she was killed earned the nickname Murder Wood by the locals. The murder of Margaret Frame would inspire caution around the forest she was killed in for quite some time. But the park was an essential part of the neighborhood, and though parents would remember the murder and take caution, children are always going to want to play in the woods, no matter how dangerous it may be. This is Monsters. In 1986, 10-year-old Nicola Fellows and 9-year-old Karen Hathaway, two best friends who lived nearby, would make Murder Wood one of their favorite hangout spots. They were playing in a different part of the woods, in a place called Wild Park, but it was all part of the same vast nature preserve. And somewhere nearby, there was still a killer on the loose. Nicola's father, Barry, took some caution when the girls started playing in the preserve. He remembered the murder of Margaret Frame, as did many other parents. Barry ended up telling the girls they could play there during the day, but that they should never roam there at night because there was a boogeyman who would come out when the sun went down and get them. Unfortunately, having a place nicknamed Murder Wood probably only made children want to explore it more. In addition to the dangers of the park, the girls grew up using caution around their neighborhood as well. They lived in Moolscombe, a suburb of the seaside city of Brighton in England. Moolscombe was an area largely made up of government-subsidized housing. One resident called it the place where people go when they've been evicted from everywhere else. There was a lot of petty crime, and the girls knew to be careful around strangers. But it was the 80s, and children were going to explore and play outside no matter what their neighborhood was like. Karen and Nicola lived just a few doors down from each other, and they met up often to explore. Locals and family described Nicola as friendly and outspoken, sometimes to the point of being cheeky. Karen was more reserved. She was quiet and smart, but wasn't above making the occasional sassy comment as well. Though the girls knew the neighborhood well, in late September, all of the local children were told to exercise caution when outside. Police had been informed that there was a strange man in his mid-twenties going around the neighborhood in a blue car who was trying to lure young girls into it. The man was clean-shaven, red-headed, and wore glasses. Because of this, all of the local children had very recently been given the stranger danger talk at school, and letters were sent out by the local police. October 9, 1986 started out as a normal day for the Hathaway and Fellows families. Karen had just gotten home from school and her pregnant mother was making her tea. She told her mother, quote, I'm just going across the road. I won't be long. At the fellow's home, a local man named Russell Bishop was visiting a lodger they had in a spare room. Russell knew the fellows and Hathaway families well and was friendly with the girls. He had at one point even lived with the fellow's family, but he'd recently begun an affair with a 16-year-old girl, and this rubbed Karen's mother, Michelle, the wrong way, so she had told the girls that they should stay away from Russell. So when Russell stopped by with his teenage girlfriend, Marion Stevenson, Nicola told them to go away and called Marion a slag. A little bit later, Karen arrived home and the two girls went off to play. 
The two first went across the street to play ball in a neighbor's yard. Then they walked out of sight of Barry and Susan Fellows. They went to Wild Park shortly afterward and started trying to climb a tree. Wild Park was nearly 600 acres and the girls favored an area with rolling meadows and forested hills. The girls were not very good at climbing trees and local park officer Roy Badswell told them to knock it off before they hurt themselves. They then went to go hang out at a fish and chip shop and a local boy who spotted them would later recall that there was a blue car parked across the street with a red-headed man behind the wheel. Then, at around 6.15, they were spotted by Tracy Cox, a local teenager who knew their families. She walked them back to their neighborhood and told them to go home because it was getting dark, but Nicola wasn't ready to go home. She ignored Tracy and grabbed Karen's hand, telling her, quote, Come on, let's go over to the park. They were last seen playing in the park at 6.30 p.m. After that, they vanished. The girls were supposed to be home by dark, and at around 7.30, Susan became worried and started rounding up neighbors to try to find where the girls had gone. Barry thought Nicola was just being rebellious by staying out late and didn't start to worry until later in the evening. The families finally called the police at 8.30 p.m., well past the girls' curfew. The next day, 50 police officers led the search, helped out by rescue dogs and dozens of citizen volunteers. The park the girls had vanished in covered a vast area, with grazing land, a golf course, and plenty of wilderness with a loose network of footpaths going through the tangled underbrush. The girls' families and friends joined in, as well as a large chunk of the neighborhood. When Russell Bishop got wind of the search that morning, he took one of his mother's trained collies out to search. Though as he departed, his father said it was better not to get involved. Six years prior, Russell's father had been detained as a suspect in the Margaret Frame case and was now cynical about trying to help out with the search. Russell ignored his father's warning and set out to help. Russell was just 20 at the time and infamous for telling tall tales. When he joined in on the search, he told fellow searchers that the dog he had with him was a trained search dog. He even went to one of the girls' homes to request a white sweatshirt so the dog could track better. In reality, the dog was trained, but just as a show dog, as his mother competed with the collies she bred. The search lasted nearly 24 hours. At around 5 p.m., local teenagers Matt Marchant and Kevin Rowland were drawn in by the commotion of the search. They were wandering the park, trying to get a better view of the police helicopters when they stumbled upon a grisly sight, the bodies of Karen and Nicola. The two were sprawled out in a den of underbrush, with Karen's corpse lying across Nicola, with her head in her lap. The case would soon become nicknamed the Babes in the Woods murders because of the parallels to the popular fairy tale. Both Susan Fellows and Michelle Hathaway were inconsolable when they got the news. Lee Hathaway was out of town and had to hear about his daughter's death over the phone. Up until that point, Barry had not been as concerned as much of the neighborhood, as he thought the girls had just run off and gotten lost. But when he got the news, he shed tears along with the rest of the family. After the bodies were found, the search for the killer, as well as any evidence left behind, began. Police were once again combing through the woods, but this time searching for clues. There was sparse evidence found at the scene of the crime, but there were numerous cloth fibers found in the shrubbery that led to where the bodies were. Police started canvassing the neighborhood as well and told the papers that they would plan on interviewing all 7,000 residents of Moolscombe if they had to in order to find the killer. An examination of the girls' bodies revealed the motive. Though both girls had been fully clothed upon their discovery, it was found that Nicola had been sexually assaulted both before and after her death. Both girls had been strangled, but strangely there didn't appear to be any sign of a struggle at the crime scene. This led police to conclude the motive for the murder was sexual and that the killer had known the girls, as they hadn't put up a fight. The area their bodies were found in was also up a steep incline in the underbrush, and it would have been physically impossible for the killer to drag both girls there away from the nearest path. Barry Fellows was brought in to formally identify the bodies. Morgue workers had laid out the bodies with flowers clutched to their chest in an attempt to make the girls seem more peaceful in death. Barry later told the papers, quote, It was awful. She was laying there with a little bunch of flowers in her hand like she was asleep. 
My baby was dead. I couldn't believe it. She was my little darling, my little sweetheart. When Barry identified Nicola's body, he put her allowance into her hand as a final goodbye. Barry spoke out with the media in the first few days of the hunt to catch the killer. He spoke of his rage upon learning that not only had his daughter been killed, but she had also been sexually assaulted. He said that if he were to get a hold of the killer, he would like to take care of him right there and then. But he understood that vigilante justice was not the way. The next day, on October 11th, hundreds of people came forward claiming to have information or otherwise wanting to speak to the police about their concerns. In the first days after the murder, the local community started a fund for anyone who could come up with useful information about the case. Local parents were worried that until the killer was caught, it might be their children next. Part of the fund was set aside to put towards the girls' funerals as well, as both of their fathers were unemployed at the time of the murders. By October 13th, the reward had grown to £8,000. By October 16th, just one week after the murders, police had visited over 3,600 houses and interviewed well over 8,000 people, effectively the whole neighborhood of Moolscombe. Backup had been brought in to help, and it was one of the largest manhunts ever in Sussex. With the killer still at large, police visited all the nearby schools to remind children to be wary of strangers. All cab drivers in the city had pictures of the girls in their taxis with a call for information. Friends, neighbors, and even strangers who lived nearby swore they would make the killer pay if he was found. While they were searching for the killer, police were also putting together a plan to protect his family when he was found, as the public seemed to be out for blood. Dozens of letters were being sent to local officials demanding that the death penalty be brought back. Michelle, heavily pregnant with her next child, spoke to the media to tell them that Karen seemed to understand the necessity to keep away from strangers, so Michelle felt certain that the attacker must have been someone the girls knew. Because the police were also convinced of that, the whole neighborhood was in a paranoid, suspicious state. Locals were interviewed on the matter, and some urged the media not to paint them as a lynch mob, while others assured the media they wanted revenge. One week after the girls vanished, police staged a reenactment of their last known whereabouts. Police hoped the spectacle would bring forth witnesses who hadn't already spoken with them and help jog the public's memories. Two local girls were enlisted to participate. Ten-year-old Leanne Martin and nine-year-old Katrina Taylor were chosen. Katrina told the press, quote, Nicola was my friend and I want to help find the killer so that he doesn't do it anymore. The night of the reenactment, Leanne and Katrina were dressed up like the girls. During the reenactment, police stopped all passing motorists to question them about if they'd been in the area that time last week. Police roped off the area in the park where the girls would end up to keep the crowds away, but first, they had to retrace the girls' steps. The girls started their journey across the street from the fellow's family home. They played ball in the front yard of a neighbor's house. They then made their way to the park and started trying to climb a tree. Local officer Roy Badswell sadly told them to get down before they got hurt, in a direct reenactment of the warning he had given the girls a week prior. Then the girls walked over to the fish and chip shop, where Tracy Cox walked them back to their neighborhood, just as she had done with the girls a week prior. She told them to go home, but the girls of course retraced the steps of Nicola and Karen and went back to Wild Park. Barry watched the reenactment for as long as he could, but couldn't make it to the end before he broke down. By the time the girls had reached the park, a crowd had gathered. Numerous officers moved amongst them, asking if anyone had seen anything. The girls walked through the park slowly, then disappeared into the trees. Though the girls were only reenacting the danger, in a strange twist of fate, Katrina Taylor would end up murdered in the forest just three miles away from the site of the reenactment. This was ten years later, when she was a young adult. She had been going down a bad path and helped out with a burglary. She ended up being stabbed to death in retaliation. Though her footsteps that fateful day were meant to foreshadow Nicola's demise, it's strange to think that she would meet a similar fate so close by just ten years later. After that first week, the majority of the canvassing had been done. Numerous dead ends brought false hope to the investigation. One prank caller claimed that he knew the killers, but refused to meet with police. 
Another caller dubbed himself Whispering Willie and claimed that he himself was the killer. Two teenage boys seen running from the scene of the crime were caught and found to just be up to unrelated mischief. Both families hoped that now that the police had had some time to process evidence, they could have a funeral for the girls and begin to get closure. The parents of the girls wanted to have them buried in graves side by side, so they could stay together even in death. But they were told they couldn't have a funeral for the girls until the murderer was caught, in case any evidence was needed. This is the first case I've ever heard of where the police said that. With the press desperate to milk the story for all it could, some papers turned to creating their own developments. Tabloid rumors spread by The Sun accused Barry Fellows of bragging about using the reward money that had been raised, about £10,000 at that point, to go on vacation to the United States as soon as the funerals were done. This was not substantiated anywhere else, but locals read it and got very upset. Susan had to speak to the media to clarify that they had never at any point asked for any money to go to them. She hoped it would go to improvements to the neighborhood that would benefit other children. This was the first time she'd spoke with the media, as she was still in extremely severe emotional distress, but she felt she had to go into the limelight to defend her husband. The search stretched through the end of October, but dwindled in November before a suspect was announced in December. News broke on December 4th that family friend Russell Bishop was being brought into court to be tried for the murders. He was denied bail and set to go to trial on the last day of the year, December 31st. At the preliminary hearing, Russell was crying and protesting his innocence. Things heated up on January 21st, 1987, during one of the first preliminary hearings. Russell told the courtroom out of turn that there was a girl out there who could prove his innocence. He wanted to make a public plea for her to come forward, and Russell's attorney did back up that an anonymous girl had called to tell him that she had evidence. Russell said his case hinged on this mystery girl. While preliminary hearings were going on and Russell was waiting for his mystery girl to appear, the girl's families were finally allowed to lay them to rest now that a suspect was in custody. The funeral took place on February 4th and more than 300 people attended. Both of the girl's brothers, Darren Hadaway and Jonathan Fellows, carried flowers alongside the pallbearers who carried two small coffins. Susan Fellows and Michelle Hadaway were very much still grieving, and though the media was largely kept out of the ceremony, the press still printed articles about how Susan wept the whole funeral, and Michelle had to leave halfway through. The girls were buried side by side just as they had been found in the woods. During the wake afterward, Drama unfolded because Russell Bishop's parents had sent flowers and a card. A family friend ripped up the card, and when the media confronted Russell's parents later, they didn't understand why their condolences were not well received. They went on to tell the press that their son was innocent and that they only meant to comfort the families. After the funeral, Karen's babysitter, Angela Cork, told reporters that, quote, If I saw the man who did it now, I would strangle him with my bare hands. While the funeral was happening, Russell was back in court. As the girls were buried, Russell's lawyer was pleading his innocence. Charles Conway, acting as the defense, went so far as to say that imprisoning an innocent man was an even worse crime than the murder of the two girls. On February 23rd, the prosecution presented the damning evidence that Russell Bishop was not only one of the last people to see the girls alive, but was one of the first on the scene to search for them. The night of the murders, shortly after the park officer told the girls to stop climbing on the tree, he spotted Russell and made small talk. This was around 5.15 p.m. No one saw Russell for the next hour and 15 minutes until two local boys saw him leaving the park. Russell participated in the search and later told police that he'd approach the bodies after they'd been found. He said he checked for pulses on both of the girls, so his fingerprints might be on their necks. He also described Nicola's corpse in vivid detail, describing details he could have only known if he'd seen the bodies. He talked about how she had bloody foam on her lips, a common side effect of being strangled. But at this point, he wouldn't have been privy to the cause of death. The problem with this story is that it directly contradicts the police account of what happened when the bodies were found. Russell had actually approached an officer who was near the bodies to brag about how he was helping with the search. The two made small talk for a bit and Russell asked the officer, Paul Smith, 
if he thought the girls would be found in the park. Smith didn't want to speculate, and Russell went on to say, quote, I reckon they've either gone north, or if they're here, they're finished. Then, when the announcement went out that the bodies had been found, he tried to run ahead of the officer to get there first, before he was stopped. He later tried to justify these inconsistencies by saying that he'd made up the detail about seeing the bodies to make himself feel like an important part of the search. The next day, the prosecution brought forth its forensic evidence. There was a sweatshirt that one of the local search parties had found the night the girls vanished. The shirt was found inside out and dry, though it was laying on wet ground, making it likely that someone had recently disposed of it. Witnesses recalled Russell wearing a light blue sweatshirt the day of the murders, and the sweater was found along the path that Russell had told police he'd taken to get home that night. There were blue fibers from that sweatshirt on both of the girls, as well as pink and green fibers from the girls' shirts found on the sweatshirt. Though Russell denied that the sweatshirt was his, a pair of pants that he owned had the same blue fibers, and one of his girlfriend's shirts had the same fibers as well. Red paint that matched what Russell used to paint cars with was found on the blue sweatshirt as well. The trial was moving slowly, and in between hearings, the public was left to stew in local rumors and gossip. During the initial hunt for a suspect, police had found Barry Fellow's alibi shaky, so he had briefly been investigated as a suspect. With the trial still underway, there were people in the neighborhood who were convinced that Barry might actually be the man responsible. Many of Barry's neighbors did not like him in the first place because he had a history of burglary and petty theft, and had distributed pornographic videos throughout the neighborhood. The Fellows family started to get their house spray-painted regularly. One attacker had written, quote, Fellows out, you are a murderer, a child molester, and a child killer. The Fellows were trying to get out of the neighborhood at this point and had a new house picked out, but someone found their address. Some would spray paint it on the house they were prepared to move into, quote, Don't let that fucking murderer move here. After that, they decided to stay put, as moving wouldn't make any difference anyway. Barry's shaky alibi was rock solid compared to Russell's, though. Russell had originally claimed that his alibi was that he went to buy a newspaper, but then later admitted he had actually gone to buy marijuana. He also admitted to trying to steal a car that night. He said he couldn't name his dealer because then he'd end up with a broken knee. Despite the fact that he was on trial for murder, Russell was no snitch. The trial stalled until November when Russell's mystery witness came forward, the woman who could proclaim his innocence. It was his common-law wife, Jenny Johnson. They had two children together and despite the fact that he cheated on her often, she was fiercely loyal to him. She had signed a document verifying that the blue sweatshirt belonged to Russell, but took the stand to say she had only caved and signed the document to get police to stop harassing her. With the sweater no longer being linked to Russell and numerous forensic blunders, the case was shaky at best. On paper, Jenny really shouldn't have had any reason to stand by Russell. When Russell began his affair with Marion Stevenson, Jenny was pregnant with their second child. At one point, Russell even left Jenny for Marion, but came crawling back after two weeks because his teenage girlfriend didn't know how to cook properly. The two would fight often, and loud enough for the neighbors to complain, but despite this, Jenny stuck by Russell. Her testimony could prove him innocent, as the majority of the forensic evidence was linked to that shirt. When the defense started looking hard at the forensic and witness evidence, the case was knocked further out of the realm of believability. The girl's time of death could not be properly estimated, and the prosecution had staked their case on the girls being murdered during the hour between 5.15 and 6.30, when no witnesses could place Russell. But numerous witnesses could place the girls playing at the park at 6.30, when Russell was spotted heading home from the park. Russell's description of the bodies was the other nail in the coffin for him, but numerous character witnesses came forward to back up Russell's claim that he lied about seeing the bodies. Friends all testified that Russell was known for telling tall tales and exaggerating, and a few witnesses from the search came forward to say they hadn't seen him go near the bodies. His mother, Sylvia Bishop, told the press, quote, He does tell porkies. He does it for attention, but he has never hurt anybody by his porkies, not in his life. Russell's own defense played up the fact that he was not very smart and lied quite a bit. At one point, Charles Conway called him, quote, 
a semi-literate, occasional, not very successful car thief. On December 10, 1987, it was time for the jury to decide. The jury deliberated for just over two hours before unanimously finding Russell Bishop not guilty. When the verdict was read, Russell collapsed and cried. Russell's brother ran to him and tried to hug him, but court officers stopped him. Russell's other family members were yelling in celebration, and Russell told them they needed to quiet down once he collected himself. Lee and Susan Hathaway declined to speak to reporters, too upset by the verdict. Russell made a big show of trying to sue the police for his arrest, but would eventually drop the charges. Shortly after Russell was released, the News of the World newspaper offered Russell $7,500 for his story. In addition to proclaiming his innocence, Marion Stevenson went to speak with them as well, and she had a shocking story to tell. She told the paper that one time when she visited the Fellows family home, she saw Barry Fellows watching a pornographic film with Nicola and an adult family friend named Dougie Judd. Marion later admitted to being quite intoxicated during this interview as the tabloid had been giving her free champagne. Her story seemed quite sensational and it seemed strange that she'd never tried to tell it to the media before. She had also been interviewed by police numerous times and had never brought up the film even though it would point to Russell being innocent and Barry being guilty, so her story didn't quite seem to add up. After his story broke, harassment of the fellow's family only intensified, especially with Russell being found innocent, but that harassment was mostly limited to the occasional graffiti attack. Police investigated the claims and found them to be unsubstantiated. After that, things calmed down a bit for Barry. Russell got the worst of vigilante justice. When he was released, locals distributed flyers with his pictures that read, quote, Warning notice, this man is a child killer. In April of 1989, someone firebombed his house during the night, putting his wife and three young children in danger. The public eventually mostly left Barry alone, but Russell was constantly getting his brake lines cut and he had to board up his windows because they were constantly being smashed by bricks and rocks. Locals harassed Russell, and police who spotted his car would often pull him over for no reason. Despite everything, on August 19, 1989, Russell joined a protest held by the girls' families marching for justice. He spoke with the media pleading that they catch the real killer. If Russell was in fact innocent, the danger his family was placed in and the public backlash against him was undeniably tragic, and he was certainly brave for still supporting the investigation. But in 1990, events would unfold that would point suspicion his way once again. On February 4, 1990, David and Susan Clifton, a local couple, were out enjoying a cup of tea at a local hiking spot called Devil's Dyke when a seven-year-old naked girl emerged from the nearby brush. She was covered in mud and extremely disoriented. The couple got her help and the hunt began for the man who had attacked her. She'd been sexually assaulted and strangled and likely might have appeared dead to the untrained eye, hinting the killer probably thought he had killed her. She had no memory of the assault because her attacker had strangled her first and thought she was already dead when he assaulted her. But she survived, and the odds of finding her attacker were much greater with her help. The girl, dubbed a Little Miss X to protect her identity, told her story to the police after she had recovered. She had been out roller skating when someone grabbed her off the street and brought her to a hiking area in the trunk of their car. 500 officers spent days combing the hiking spot for clues. Devil's Dyke is a rather large valley with meadows and forests, so officers didn't want to miss anything. While the search was happening, however, another squad of officers made their way to the houses of local sex offenders and suspicious persons. They visited Russell Bishop within a few hours of finding Little Miss X, and he was ready for a fight. He immediately tried attacking police officers with a fire poker while his girlfriend punched them and screamed, and his mother made threats. Russell was eventually brought into the station, and before stepping into a lineup, he went into the bathroom to wet his hair to make it seem darker. Police realized what he was doing immediately and told him to knock it off. Little Miss X picked him out right away. When Russell went to court, this time the evidence was much more solid. The trial began in late 1990. 
During the course of the trial, relatives of Little Miss X, as well as the Fellows, Hadaways, and Russell's extended family all crowded into the courtroom. Invested members of the public waited in line for a spot as well, eager to see justice done, or simply to take in the spectacle. One local told the papers as he waited in line that the trial was, quote, the biggest show in town. The prosecution had a very convincing case. Multiple witnesses had spotted Russell near where the girl was kidnapped, working on his car with the trunk open. The girl would later describe the trunk of his car in perfect detail. Though Russell had told the girl that he would kill her if she made any noise, she bravely tried to break out or at least get attention by hitting the roof of the trunk with a hammer. Inside the trunk, they found dents and paint flecks consistent with her story. Other witnesses placed his car at Devil's Dyke. Russell's car had three matching tires and one that didn't match, and tire tracks matching his tires were found at the scene of the crime. DNA testing had recently become a well-known and usable method of catching criminals, so police also had that on their side. They'd found damning DNA evidence on the girl. The odds that the DNA had come from someone other than Russell Bishop were 80 million to one. Near the end of the trial, Little Miss X wrote a letter published in the media thanking everyone for their support and gifts that were sent to her. She wrote, quote, To all my friends, I would like to thank you for all the lovely presents you have given me. I'm feeling very well now and all my scratches have gone. I'm having a lovely Christmas and would like to wish you a Merry Christmas. Little Miss X appeared in court behind a privacy screen so she would not have to look at Russell. She gave testimony and was praised for being articulate. She told her story for nearly an hour, describing what she remembered from the ordeal. The defense went for an angle that Russell was being set up in a police conspiracy, going so far as to say they had stolen Russell's car after the fact to make the tire tracks, and stolen used condoms from his home to fake the DNA test. Russell's family argued that the police were framing him for this crime because they had never gotten him for the Babes in the Woods murders. During the trial, Russell's defense talked a great deal about his life in order to try and garner sympathy. Russell had four older brothers and a protective mother, Sylvia, who all babied him. Russell had academic difficulties that at the time classified him as subnormal. After failing numerous special education schools, his parents opted to homeschool him and brought in private tutors. With a lack of education, it was very hard for him to find work. He ended up making a living through a combination of odd manual labor jobs, car detailing, and petty theft. Sylvia later told the papers that before she'd had Russell, she'd had a baby pass away. She'd always felt like having Russell helped her heal from that. She admits that she babied him a bit because of that and because he was the youngest. This testimony only served to convince the public that Russell's family should be punished as well for standing by him. A letter was sent to a local paper that read, quote, Please tell the Russells and Jenny Johnson to get out of Brighton. Last time was just a warning. Near the end of the trial, Russell's mom broke down in court begging the public to leave her family alone. On December 13, 1990, it was time for the jury to decide. The jury deliberated for over four hours before eventually finding Russell guilty. Russell Bishop was given life in prison for the attack. As the verdict was read, Russell held his face in his hands. The judge said that Russell's heinous crimes were made all more disturbing because he was the father of very young children himself. When the sentence was read out, members of the gallery cheered, while others yelled that Russell should be hanged. Sylvia's plea to the public during the trial had fallen on deaf ears. On December 17th, in the early morning hours, the firebombing attacks continued. It was well known that Russell had just been incarcerated for life, so the bomber was now targeting his family. One bomb was placed outside Alec Russell's house, Russell's brother. It damaged his van, but didn't cause any injuries. Another bomb was thrown into the backyard of Russell's mother, splashing her dogs with fuel, but it failed to explode. After the trial, the fellows and the Hadaways were no doubt relieved that the monster who'd killed their children had been put away, but Russell had not been put away for the murder of their children, so to them, it felt a bit as if justice had never quite been served. Russell's lack of proven guilt about the murders also meant that the door was still open for public speculation on the guilt of Barry Fellows, so Nicola's parents had to live with that shadow over them. 
The case would fall out of both the public and law enforcement's interest for quite some time. In 2002, there were talks of new legislation that would allow for exceptions to the laws preventing double jeopardy if new evidence was found, so police reopened the file on Nicola and Karen's murders. In 2005, the double jeopardy laws were changed to give a chance of conviction, but the police knew they needed to be careful this time and not risk botching the investigation. They tried comparing some DNA samples once again, but unfortunately DNA testing was still not advanced enough to reveal anything useful. However, they were able to more closely link fibers found on the sweatshirt to Russell's home. The case stalled again until 2009. On April 7th, Sussex police visited the home of Barry Fellows. When police knocked on his door, Barry braced himself for the news that there had been some kind of break in Nicola's case. But instead, officers said they were there to arrest him for molesting Nicola. Police questioned Barry, but found nothing of consequence upon searching his house and electronics. As soon as Barry got out of jail, he told the media that the allegations made were the same ones printed in News of the World back in 1987. Barry told the media that allegations were brought back up by some anonymous person, conveniently right before Russell's parole hearing, and that he suspected someone was trying to create doubt in the public's mind that Russell committed the crimes. Barry tried to go to work the next day, but his managers told him to stay home, as he worked with the public. His work feared people might try and attack him on the job, but instead, Barry was met with an outpouring of support from the community. The investigation took three months, and Barry later remarked that being accused of molesting his daughter was the worst thing that had happened to him since Nicola died. After the investigation, Barry told The Independent, quote, The deaths of my daughter and her friend destroyed two families. This false allegation could have destroyed me all over again, but I won't let it. I've got a great family and children, and I'm just going to get on with my life. The last 12 weeks were hell, but they're over now. I just hope the police forget it and get on with trying to catch whoever murdered Nicola and Karen. Despite Barry's frustration with the police, they were in fact still trying to catch his daughter's killer. In 2012, with new advancements being made in DNA testing technology, police decided to try again. The testing took three years. The new double jeopardy law stated that police would only have one try to get Russell if they were to retry him, so they had to make sure the case was bulletproof. They found skin flakes from Russell on Karen's arm. They also found Russell's DNA on the blue sweatshirt that he had famously denied being his. They checked other samples and ruled out the possibility that the DNA could have been there just because Russell hung out at the fellow's house. In the end, the odds that the DNA tests were wrong were over 1 billion to 1. On May 10, 2016, Russell was taken into a police van. He figured he was just being transferred to a new prison, but instead, officers told him he was finally going to face justice for the murder of Nicola Fellows and Karen Hathaway. With evidence gathering and preliminary hearings out of the way, trial finally began in October of 2018. 32 years after the girls had been killed. During the trial, Russell's defense attempted once again to prove that there was reasonable doubt that Russell killed the girls because there was just as much evidence to point to Barry. Barry's history of domestic abuse was brought up, which had been hidden from the public up until that point. Barry thought that slapping was sometimes a needed punishment to get children in line, and would sometimes slap Nicola. He had once hit an elderly relative and broke her nose, but he claimed it was an accident. Barry's alibi was suspicious on the night of the murders because he hadn't told Susan where he was and she couldn't find him when she first realized the girls were missing. That day, Barry had been cleaning a swimming pool, then stopped by a butcher to pick up meat for dinner. Then he popped in to say hi to Dougie Judd, an alibi that could be shaky if Dougie Judd was complicit in the murders. Barry and Dougie both took the stand and were asked repetitive questions about whether or not they had abused or plotted to kill Nicola. The defense said that it was very strange that the attacker had put Nicola's underwear back on after she'd been assaulted, saying that it almost seemed as if the killer was ashamed of what he had done or had some kind of affection for the girl. All of these accusations hinged on the fact that Barry had allowed Dougie to abuse Nicola, though. But the pathologist who had examined Nicola's body was able to very easily refute that. 
Pathologist Nathaniel Carey took to the stand and spoke about the condition of Nicola's body. She had been assaulted with a blunt object both before and after death, but her hymen was still intact, and all injuries were clearly inflicted during the murder. If Barry or Dougie had assaulted her prior, there would have been clear signs. Russell's defense took a scattered approach after that. Russell made the weak argument of saying his DNA was on the girls because he had in fact checked them for a pulse, but no one was buying it. Russell decided that since he was already serving time for the attempted murder of Little Miss X, the best thing to do would be to admit that he had done that crime, but deny that he had ever killed anyone. Russell testified that he had told many lies during the 1990 trial, but that he wasn't lying now about not having killed Karen or Nicola. He said that the reason he had grabbed Little Miss X in February was because he was in poor mental health due to the town's harassment of him. Russell said that at one point at the start of 1990, he put his children in his car and drove a scenic road with steep cliffs. He said he was thinking of killing himself and taking his children with him. Near the end of the trial, around Thanksgiving, the prosecution tried to get Russell to admit he had sexual interest in children because of what he had done to Little Miss X. He tried to say that he'd only attacked the seven-year-old girl because he was mentally ill, not because he had sexual interest in children. He claimed that the girl was roller skating past him as he'd hurt himself trying to fix his car. He thought the girl had said a smart remark to him and said he assaulted her, quote, to belittle and shame her because I was bloody angry at her and everyone who had done wrong to me. He also said that he was not a pedophile, but if he was going to be branded one for life, he figured he might as well give it a try. Oh, well, that clearly makes sense. Marion took the stand in late November. She said that despite being 16 at the time, police officers had ordered her to have sex with Russell to get closer to him and get him to confess. The two were likely already sexually active at the time, so this is a bit of an odd story. Supposedly, police had bugged Russell's apartment to listen for any incriminating evidence, and Marion was going to go forward with the plan, but Russell discovered the bug. The prosecution denied that this happened and suggested Marion might be confused because officers had planted bugs at her parents' house in the hopes Russell might say something incriminating. Marion became quite upset when she was accused of being a liar and had to take a break. She was then further questioned about her stories accusing Barry as well as her general inconsistencies in her reports to the police. Marion tried to say that the inconsistencies at the time were because she was always high and drunk back in those days, but because she was sober now she could remember everything more clearly. The prosecution was not convinced by this and asked her if perhaps she'd been confused at the time about seeing the video, but she said she absolutely remembered what happened. She said she'd been smoking marijuana with Russell and Dougie when she went to get some water from the kitchen. But when she approached, she heard sexual noises coming from the TV and witnessed Barry watching a pornographic film with Nicola. Marion's old statements were read out loud and she stuck to everything she had said back then. When asked why she didn't report Dougie and Barry for being pedophiles, either before the murders or during the manhunt, she said it was because she was scared and unsure of what to do. She did express regret on this point, saying that perhaps if she'd done something sooner, the girls would still be alive. Marion's statements were often contradictory and didn't line up with the evidence, but she was a child at the time of the murders, only six years older than Nicola. Though her statements seem perhaps untruthful, she's never been tried for perjury, and whether she believes her own statements or not, she was a child at the time who was constantly high, drunk, scared, and dating an abusive pedophile. The other woman in Russell's life at the time, Jenny Johnson, took the stand in Russell's favor once again, though the two were long separated. The prosecution went through the timeline of her statements in detail with her. When police knocked on Jenny's door with the blue sweatshirt and an evidence bag shortly after the murders, she instantly asked them if they were bringing Russell's sweatshirt back. She then signed a statement acknowledging the sweatshirt as Russell's, but later she recanted the statement. She said she had bad eyesight and confused the sweatshirt for a similar one Russell owned. But after police told her that Russell and Marion were still having an affair, she signed the statement out of spite. This contradicts her earlier statement in 1987 that she signed it because the police were harassing her and alluding she was involved. Jenny still, 32 years later, stood by Russell and said the sweatshirt was not his. 
The other piece of evidence that pointed to Russell's innocence in 1987 was the timeline of witness statements. Witnesses thought they had seen the girls alive at 6.30 p.m., which is when Russell was seen walking home by other witnesses. It was only after the first trial that police realized that Russell must have in fact been spotted leaving the park at 6.30, then decided to head back afterwards, which is when the murders happened. With this new timeline, all witness statements pointed to Russell as the killer. On December 10th, the jury deliberated for just over two hours, but this time, he was found guilty. Russell Bishop was sentenced to life in prison. Family members were glad that justice had been served, but wish it could have been sooner. Karen's father, Lee, died in 1998 and never saw Russell found guilty. In her victim impact statement, Michelle said, quote, if Bishop had pleaded guilty 31 years ago, my healing could have started then. I was 29 when Karen was killed, and I'm now 61 years old. Karen's death destroyed my husband Lee, and I had to raise my young family on my own. Despite the courts finding Russell guilty, Barry Fellows was never able to fully escape the shadow of the accusations against him. There are those around Moolscombe that still think Barry was the murderer. One woman interviewed by The Independent after the trial said that, quote, Russell would have never worn that Pinto sweatshirt. He loved to wear his sweatshirts tight. Russell had a beautiful body. Barry said that his daughter still has nightmares about when he was arrested, and she was questioned about if she was being sexually abused. She was only 14. Barry said that the accusations have affected the way he acts around children, constantly afraid of being accused of something, so he's not as affectionate as he would like to be with his grandkids. In May of 2021, Jenny Johnson was finally found guilty of perjury for her part in preventing justice 32 years prior. Just a year later, on January 20th, 2022, Russell Bishop died of cancer in prison. Though he only technically served four years for the murders of Karen and Nicola, that doesn't change the fact that he had finally faced justice. If you visit Wild Park today, you'll find the same lovely woods and rolling meadows that the girls love to explore so much. There are little signs reminding visitors not to feed the ducks, and there are more trail maps now. The park has been somewhat tamed, and among the signs and maps, near the last spot they were seen lies a plaque that reads, quote, Nicola Fellows and Karen Hathaway, always in our hearts and never forgotten. Russell Bishop was a predator hiding in plain sight. He tried to convince the world that he was being framed for the crimes he had committed, but in the end, it was proven that he was in fact a monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.